I, we will start the last, uh, the last of the seminars of this course on frontier research in astrophysics and particle physics of the master in, in particle physics and physics of the cosmos that uh, is, uh, is finishing this year. Today is a, is a great pleasure to host uh, Professor Eichiro Komatsu. Uh, Ichiro Komatsu is the director of the Max Planck uh, Institute for Astrophysics in Garching since 2012. Mm -hmm. Previously to that, he has been working for several years at the Texas University in Austin. As he was professor at, at, the, at the Austin University and also of the Texas Center for Cosmology. I think I don't know if, if this center is still working. Ichiro, I, I guess it's so still there. It's still there. <laughs> but not only that. He was, uh, he was a <coughs> member of the WMAP team that uh, got the Gruber Prize in Cosmology for the very important achievements obtained by this uh, CMB mission. He's a, a very well-known and uh, recognized uh, scientist in cosmology, theoretical cosmology, data analysis, on CMB and large scale structure. And on top of that, he's an excellent speaker and very pedagogical. I'm sure we will enjoy very much the talk and the students afterwards even more. So I just, I just make, make a, a, a reminder that after the seminar that will last for an hour, we have 15 minutes of open questions for the public in the room. And after that, the students and those teachers of the master that want to stay with us, we will have a chat with uh, Professor Komatsu to have further discussion on the topic. So that's all. Thank you okay. for okay, coming. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. Thanks for this. So he's raising a bar very high. So let me see uh, if I can satisfy your expectation. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, today's topic is this. So we have gravitational waves. So uh, of course we can't see the gravitational waves. Uh, we try to visualize it by the motion of particles. So at the moment, in this room, let's imagine that the gravitational waves are coming toward you, right, from the back side of the screen to you. Then we place the ring of particles. Then the motion of this important thing, there are two important things, you, well, actually three important things you can learn from this. One is uh, the gravitational waves distort space perpendicular to the propagation of the wave. So the wave is transverse. Uh, second, the distortion created by gravitational waves is area conserving. So they do not change volume, which means they do not generate the density fluctuation. And finally, they come in two polarization states. Uh, you can call them left and right handed circular polarizations, or you can also think of this in terms of two linear polarization states, depending upon how you choose the basis. So I'm showing here two linearly polarized gravitational waves and they always exist. They always coexist. Yeah? So these are the three things that, that are very important. Now typically, uh, so there, I know that there was a seminar on gravitational wave already and that was probably for the propagation of gravitational waves in the non-expanding universe. But uh, we try to generalize that to the expanding universe. So let's start with the basics. We have this distance between two points in space. The uh, e easiest way to understand what the gravitational waves do is to think of this in terms of the distortion in the distance between two points. So everybody, everybody knows uh, distance between two points in Cartesian coordinate in flat Euclidean space is given by this formula. Then uh, we let the space expand homogeneously and isotropically, so you have just multiplied the distance between two points in space by the uniform time-dependent coefficient, <coughs> which we call scale factor. So this A increases monotonically. To put that in, uh, then this will describe how the space expands or contracts. Then we write this uh, dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared in a fancy way using uh, Kronecker's delta, so this is 1 for i equals j, 0 otherwise, so these two are just completely equal, I just wanted to write in a fancy way. <laughs> then we let the space curve by deviating from Kronecker delta to something else, okay? And that's all. 
that's all we have to do. Okay? Then we ask Einstein to tell us how the curvature in space changes over time. You get an answer, you solve them, and you calculate observables, you measure them, compared to theory, you're done. Okay? Easy. <laughs> so uh, this is the uh, three by three symmetric matrix, which has six components. But the real degrees of freedom of gravitational waves, as I told you, is two. Two linear polarization states. So how do we go from one to the other? Uh, first of all, this wave is transverse. So the distortion in space is perpendicular to the propagation direction, in which case I would say it's k vector. So k vector times the HIJ coefficients summed over i should be zero. This will give you three conditions because there are three j's. Yeah, okay. It's a free index. Index there are three j's, so this uh, will give you three conditions. Then this is area conserving distortion in space. So the determinant of the uh, distance between two points is uh, unchanged, which means this HII, this uh, trace of HIJ is zero. Therefore, uh, it's, it's, it's one of the conditions. So you have four conditions, six components, minus four conditions is two independent dynamical degrees of freedom. Okay? So you get two polarization out of that. Then you choose the uh, coordinate such that the uh, propagation direction is pointing in a Z direction. So third axis. Then, the uh, most generic way to write that kind of situation, so you have x and y on which uh, particles are moving. There's no motion of particles in z direction. Okay? Then, that's it. So you have the trace, which is zero, and it's a symmetric uh, matrix, and you have two degrees of freedom. That's it. Okay? So we call this plus mode, and you call this x mode. Of course, you, when you change, rotate the coordinates by 45 degrees, x becomes plus, plus becomes x. But the uh, important thing is that uh, these, so which one is cross and which one is plus depends on coordinates. But the fact that these two states coexist is a coordinate independent segment. Right? So that's, that's a very important thing to know. And uh, um, if you write this in terms of the uh, z direction, in the horizontal axis, and then x and y in the perpendicular direction, then plus uh, x nodes <coughs> propagate like that, right? So you have the plane wave whose amplitude goes from a negative to positive to negative to positive, and what that means is simply you have this uh, distortion. And that's the phase of gravitational waves. All right, so let's try to see how this HIJ depends on the time. Then there, you just have to Go to the Einstein's equation, then write it down in terms of HIJ, and put this uh, uh, conditions that uh, it's transverse and traceless. Then you just arrive at this, which is nothing but essentially the wave equation, if you ignore this uh, second term here, uh, k is a wave vector, wave, wave number, square, so this is just a, a second spatial derivative. For plane wave, it's just k square. Uh, so if you look at this, it's just a uh, wave equation. So indeed, the gravitational waves are waves, uh, as I promised, sourced by the matter. The Tij represents the matter and pressure and the viscosity and everything, all the properties of the matter. But uh, there's this thing here, which looks like a friction term because it's proportional to Hij dot. So this is going to do something. This will modify the evolution of gravitational waves. Uh, it's it will deviate from a simple uh, harmonic oscillator. And all expansion does is that. And also it stretches space, therefore the, uh, the wave number also changes. Namely, so this k over a is the physical wave number, and as the universe expands, Physical wave number is proportional to 1 over a, which means if you have one wave number, wave number gets smaller and smaller and smaller, which means wavelengths gets longer and longer and longer. Right? So uh, wavelengths of gravitational waves get stretched as the universe expands. All of this, just you don't have to think, is just uh, take uh, this uh, space-time coordinate 
uh, and then space time distance, then you plug this into the Einstein's equation, you get this automatic value. Okay, so uh, what does it do? So this, you can actually plug this into the uh, Mathematica and let me solve it, you can get an analytic solution, but that's not very eliminating. So let me try to uh, do it the more uh, uh, intuitive way. Um, let's see, so in an uh, expanding universe, space gets multiplied by scale factor, but time is not. Space expands, but time doesn't necessarily expand, right? So there's asymmetry between time and space, which makes this equation somewhat co uh, complicated. Therefore, let's try to define the conformal time such that uh, both space <coughs> and time get multiplied by the same factor of A. This conformal time is by no means the physical time, it's not, it's some time that you just don't understand, but it makes mathematics transparent. And it makes more physical, more contact with the flat space Minkowski kind of equations that you are more familiar with. So replace time derivative by conformal time derivative, then you get that. Okay, so three became two. Okay? And then you eliminate this a square, because the whole thing will get multiplied by one of a square, you cancel a square by multiplying both sides by a square, then just k square, which is wonderful, then you have a square on the right hand side. Okay, so this prime is sort of conformal time derivatives. It still looks kind of, so we eliminated successfully a square here, but uh, this thing is still kind of bothering. So let's do the following. I define a new quantity, which is hij times a. Why? I don't know. I'll just do it. But, uh, but there's a beautiful reason behind this, and I'll try to explain that later. But for now, it's just a uh, trick. Then you eliminate the second term. And you get new term here. But now you just eliminated the friction term. So now suddenly it becomes a very, very harmonic oscillator looking thing. It's just that you have new term, a double lot of uh, a double prime over right here. Okay? Now, <coughs> let me write this down in a more sort of, uh, intuitive way. So I define the mass, mass square, <coughs> which is minus a double prime over a. I just write it, you know? Then, then this equation becomes like this. Now this equation suddenly looks like a harmonic oscillator with a mass. But the mass is time-dependent. It's a time-dependent harmonic oscillator. That's the gravitational wave in an expanding universe. And all the effect of expansion of the universe is to give you a time-dependent mass. And this is like a swing. Right? You have the uh, time-dependent mass by your motion. and. Uh, you get amplification or decrease of the uh, amplitude of uh, swing. That's that, okay? Now it looks very simple, right? It looks really like you have the harmonic oscillator in Minkowski space, except, but this one, you know, don't forget, we are not in Minkowski space. Uh, looks very simple now, but uh, you, you have this important factor. And uh, as this uh, formula tells you, it may be even negative. <laughs> so it's, it's, not, it's not such a trivial thing. But uh, if you write in this way, it looks very simple. All right, so let's forget now the uh, source, okay? I want to calculate, once you generated gravitational waves in some way, how do they propagate in vacuum? So you just set the right hand side with zero, and this equation essentially tells you there are two regimes. K is much less, much less than M, or K is much greater than M. And because M can be imaginary, right? M squared is minus a the prime divided by A, so I just put the absolute value here. So in a short wavelength mode, K much, much greater than M, then you just have a, a simple harmonic oscillator. But it's a decay, okay? So first of all, the fact that it's just simple harmonic oscillator makes sense because when in a short, very, very high frequency modes, they just do not feel uh, expansion of the universe very much. But they still remember the fact that it's expanding space, 
Therefore, their amplitude redshifts away. <coughs> uh, easy way to think about this is that uh, so H de decays like, a, like a 1 over A, okay? Because if U is A times H, if U is just E to the K, IK eta, H will be 1 over A. Yeah? Because gravitational waves are radiation like, you know, they are massless particles. Their energy density will be redshift uh, away, like radiation. Therefore, the amplitude of gravitational waves has to decrease in time as the universe expands. Yeah? So it's reflected there. But a very interesting thing happens in the opposite limit. When k is much less than m, u grows in time. It's proportional to a. Because in that limit, u double prime is equal to a double prime divided by a times u. So solution is u is proportional to a. So that's an amplification of gravitational waves in the long wavelength limit. So you have this swing, and you tune your motion, and this amplitude gets amplified and amplified. Right? So expansion doesn't always let the gravitational wave decay, but they actually help you. Gravitational waves, <coughs> amplitude stay constant. So u goes like a, but h is constant. Wow. That doesn't look like a gravitational wave. It's not oscillating even. So you have this freezing uh, perturbations on very long wavelengths. So once this uh, fluctuation goes above this scale set by m, they don't change. What does this scale then? What does this mean? So let's uh, uh, write this a double dot over a in terms of the expansion rate. So I define h have expansion rate as a dot, which is the time derivative, not the conformal time derivative. Time derivative will be divided by a. And one, so this has a dimension of 1 over time, or 1 over length in natural unit, if you set the speed of light to be 1. 1 over h is the size of the observable universe. Or at least it approximates it. Okay? Actual size of the observable universe is a factor times 1 over h. So, but 1 over h is a good uh, proxy for the size of the observable universe. And because k is the 1 over wavelengths, h essentially separates the modes inside the horizon and outside the horizon. So if k is below m, that's a long wavelength super horizon fluctuation. Okay? And shorter wavelengths are sub horizon. <coughs> So once gravitational waves wavelengths get bigger than horizon, they stop oscillating. So they don't behave like waves that as we typically think. But but universe expands, and these modes come inside the horizon, and they start oscillating and decay. Yeah. Weird. <laughs> and but this is very important. Uh, there's an important concept, namely. Gravitational waves now enter the horizon. It's a tricky concept, so let, let me spend a little time explaining it. So let's suppose that in the early universe something happened and you have gravitational waves at all wavelengths. Sub-horizon or super-horizon. Somehow you have <coughs> all wavelengths for gravitational waves. Then let the universe evolve. As time expands, uh, as the universe expands, horizon size grows in time. So you can see more and more longer wavelengths perturbations, right? A bit like, uh, uh, yeah, let's see. I don't know. I don't know what that good analogy is, but uh, you 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 can see because you can see things inside of your light cone. But if you wait, you patiently wait. You can your light cone expands, and you can see more and more of the bigger scale. Yeah, what? <laughs> So when you have long wavelength perturbations before, somehow imprinted in the universe, you can see more and more of those. And uh, so the vertical axis is the physical wavelengths of fluctuations. For example, and this is today. So this is 10, gig 10 gigaparsec today, 1 gigaparsec today, 1 megaparsec today. And this is the size of the horizon. Okay? So this area is super horizon. K is less than M. This is sub horizon. And as you can see, shorter wavelength perturbations 
any time of horizon earlier. And longer wavelength perturbations end at the horizon later. So even if you started with uh, gravitational waves at all wavelengths, shorter wavelengths get inside the horizon first, and they decay. Right? And longer wavelengths get inside the uh, horizon later, so they preserve more initial conditions. Right? So this uh, long, wavelength long wavelength gravitational waves rem remembers the initial conditions. So this gives you the window into probing the physics of the early universe using the gravitational waves. All thanks to this fact that the gravitational waves stay constant. If they decay all the time, they will be so small today that there is no hope of seeing them. But because they don't decay on super horizon scale, they just get preserved. Right? This allows us to see them. So let's talk about talk about the source. Were there any sources in the early universe? We don't really know, <laughs> because we haven't seen them yet. But uh, yes, in the sense that there are many papers. <laughs> and the uh, you know, universe is big. You know, as long as you don't violate energy conservation, momentum conservation, anything that's possible is possible. <laughs> so I'm sure that there are lots of sources in the universe producing gravitational waves. It doesn't mean that we can see them, but I'm sure there are, there are tons of sources there. But that's not, that's too complicated. Uh, so that's not the uh, topic of today's lecture. If you are interested, however, there's a very nice review article published last year. So it's quite up to date. Uh, so please uh, have a look. So today, we talk about quantum mechanical generation. So there's no source. But even if there's no source, gravitational waves can emerge quantum mechanically. And that's pretty spectacular, if it's true. And uh, in order to see how this is even possible, we just have to quantize the left-hand side and see what happens. Okay. So we, we don't talk about this right-hand side until the very, very end of the lecture. All right. So, but uh, even if you manage to create quantum fluctuations, for example, quantum fluctuations exist in this room, and there are always vacuum fluctuations popping out of the vacuum, and then they go inside, go disappear into the vacuum. What's the, how do you even create these uh, perturbations that are on very large scales from quantum mechanics. It doesn't seem possible. So the connection then is this expansion of the universe. You have these very short wavelengths gravitational waves popping up. Then, as soon as these uh, fluctuations of emerge, expansion of the, of the universe can take these wavelengths to very, very long wavelengths. And once they become long wavelengths, their amplitude gets frozen. So they do not disappear into the vacuum anymore. You manage to steal energy out of the vacuum. Hmm? <laughs> Weird. <laughs> but, uh, but this can happen. And uh, to do this, you need this uh, cosmic inflation. Namely, you have the very rapid period of a very rapid expansion. You have a brief period of a very rapid expansion, which takes Basically, you have this uh, scale factor which is uh, increasing with acceleration. So, by definition, uh, second time derivative of A should be positive. I can write down a double dot over A in terms of H, expansion rate. So, this is the exact formula. This has to be greater than zero. So, if you divide new variable, that's minus H dot divided by H squared, this has to be less than one. That's the definition of the accelerating universe. But the inflation doesn't just require kind of uh, su uh, subtle, weak acceleration. They want to have a very large acceleration and sustained period of acceleration. So in fact, uh, you, you actually need this quantity much less than unity, not just less than unity. That means the time scale of uh, change of h is long compared to the expansion rate itself, which means this h of t 
is a only slowly varying function of time. In fact, to good approximation, you can ignore h dot. If you do that, then equation gets simplified. So this m square was minus a w prime divided by a. That's 2h square plus h dot. But now I'm ignoring h dot. h is now constant. So that's this. And uh, uh, if you, and a, h is a dot over a. If h is constant, solution is nothing but a growing exponentially in time. So this is a very rapid acceleration of the universe. In terms of this funny time, conformal time, it's not uh, physical time, it's just a mathematical convenience. This a is 1 over eta. Uh, so if you plug this back in here, you just have that. Oh, I can solve this. Uh, all right. Plug this into Mathematica. <laughs> can you get this? <coughs> now you have integration constants. How do we determine that? So if you have a source, you get generated the source at some initial time, then you, that fixes the integration constants, right? But we don't have sources. We just have quantum mechanics. So how do we de determine these coefficients? Well, you ask Heisenberg now. <laughs> and then let these coefficients determine by quantum mechanics. So we find these coefficients such that this u coincides with the known flat space result in a very small scale. Namely, when you take k to be deeply sub-horizon, such that you should expect the result to be the same as Minkowski, flat space, non-expanding. Then that sets the initial condition. So you set the initial condition deep inside the horizon. Then, after that, expansion takes care of it. So it stretches the wavelength to large scales. Then everything will, uh, will be determined afterwards. All right, but uh, how do we do that? Okay. Here, then, it, it becomes actually important how to define u. Remember that this u I defined by very heuristic argument. Namely, I just wanted to get rid of the friction term and put it here. So I multiply hij by a. That's what the u, u was. Is that the correct normalization? The answer is no. You actually have something else. But to do this, you need to go to the action. Okay? So, uh, Einstein here out action is given by this. So if you differentiate this action with respect to g mu nu, that's the space-time metric, you get Einstein's equation. Right? <coughs> uh, well, in other words, this, once you know what this is, the, uh, all the equation motion should be given fairly trivially. To see this, for example, you can expand at action level. So first thing you can do, which we have done already, you Variate this action with respect to g mu nu, you derive Einstein's equation. You plug into the Einstein's equation, this space time metric, the so distance between two points, and I got the equation of motion for HIJ. That's what we have done so far. But instead of doing that, I can directly expand R to second order in HIJ, then write down the quadratic action for this. Then you can use Euler Lagrange equation, so just vary this with, with respect to Hij dot and Hij, and you derive the equation motion for Hij, and you get the same answer, of course. Except, you have this coefficient here, right? Nominally, so let me write this down. So this is the result, right? Once you go from here to there, uh, you extend the action to quadratic order in Hij, this is what you get, because Hij contains two polarization, H plus H cross, and there are two of them, right? So hij squared is h11 squared plus h22 squared plus h12 squared plus h21 squared. h11 and h22 are h, h plus. If you have two of those, so two cancels out here. And I have h plus squared, h cross square, right? But I still have this funny prefactor here. When you do the action, um, you don't want this. Uh, you just want to have space-time integral, and just that. This is a kinetic term. In other words, 
these kinetic terms are not yet correctly normalized. What? Canonically normalized. <coughs> so we call the action canonically normalized only when this coefficient is 1. So this tells you that H is not the right quantity to play with if you wanted to quantize these things. So let's do the canonical normalization. First of all, d4x is the, uh, in the flat space, is the dt and d3x. Now I want to use conformal time to make as close the analogy to the Minkowski as possible. Because if you go to the eta, space and time are now treated equally. Both of them get multiplied by a. So that's the closest you can ever get to the Minkowski space. Okay? So that's, that you pick up extra factor of a here, so you a to the 4, da to the 3x. Then you define to absorb this into field, you multiply h lambda by m plank over square root of 2. Uh, I forgot to explain that the M-Planck is uh, just nothing but 1 over square root of 8 by G. Okay. Yeah? That's trivial. It's constant, so just be, let, get that absorbed into here. We also need to absorb A. Okay? So multiply H lambda by A, so you take care of two A's. You still have two more A's. You take care of that by simply replacing time derivative by conformal time derivative. Then, ta -da! <laughs> nothing here. <laughs> And you have this funny master <coughs> appearing again. This is the correct normalization. This is the correct second reduction that you can finally quantize. Okay? Once you're given this, then you're very happy. The only tricky thing is the time-dependent mass. Uh, but that's fine, because all we now do is to go back to this equation and write them down in terms of u lambda. Okay. Everything stays the same, just because we just have the different coefficient. Uh, only difference between this and before is this <coughs> factor of m prime divided by square root of 2. That's the only difference, you see. But to figure out what this is, we have to do this exercise. There's no way you can guess this without doing that. Right? So, this is an important factor. Uh, for example, if you didn't, maybe you can figure out m plan by dimensional, dimensional argument, but not square root of 2. And if you get square root of 2 wrong, you get all the, square root of, you get all the uh, observation results interpreted in the wrong way by square root of 2. Maybe that's not a big deal, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's important. So now we know that the, this thing has to go to the Minkowski result in a very, very high frequency limit. Deeply some horizon, this should result to the uh, Minkowski result. That you just take it from the whatever uh, textbook you might have. You just take it. Once you take it and you say, okay, in the deep sub horizon limit, this is zero, this is zero, this is not zero. You want to get cosine and sine, and you get, get an exponential. So you just have b lambda, which is minus i and you have 1 over square root of 2k. Oh, easy. That's the normalization. Then that's the final result. This is the canonically normalized solution for gravitational waves quantum mechanically produced from the space that's accelerated. Yeah? Good. So in sub horizon limit, this is zero, so you recover the Minkowski result. But in the opposite limit, this is no longer relevant, and this dominates. So suddenly, your mode functions deviate very strongly from the vacuum result in sub horizon. From observers outside, it looks like a particle production. So this is a particle production by the expanding space. First person who discovered this is Leonard Parker, who did not do this in this accelerating space, but he discovered that this funny thing happens. Then uh, 
Uh, Leonard Gruschuk discovered that this applies to gravitational waves as well. It's 1974. He called this non-adiabatic amplification of gravitational waves. People sort of received it with suspicion because it it's just doesn't seem right. <laughs> But then uh, Stravinsky also derived it uh, in 1979, and a number of other people derived it, and now we know this is the right way to do calculations. Well, maybe not. We should see it in our experiments, right? <laughs> All right, so let's take this super horizon limit. That, right? So you drop this term and you'll take this one. Okay? But this U is not, yet, not really gravitational waves, you know, it's a funny fact of. Uh, a and uh, n plank over 2 and stuff. So let's use this to re rewrite this. Then you get h of this. So h, little h is big H. That's the amplitude of gravitational wave on super horizon scale. Yeah? That's the most important result. Okay? Uh, in fact, uh, because h has the dimension, but this little h doesn't have a dimension, therefore, you just divide that by n Planck to make it dimensionless, and that's all you have. The result looks very simple, but the uh, you know, calculation was also similarly simple, but uh, it's not, not always too trivial. So how do you inter interpret this? Uh, well, so you've seen the real thing, right? So uh, uh, you don't you know exactly how we got this result. But uh, when I give public talks or when I give colloquium, I don't have time for that, okay? <laughs> it's not a lecture. So what I say is, if you ask uh, Heisenberg that he will tell you, uh, he, if he promised to return uh, energy in, the, in a short time period, you can borrow energy from the vacuum, right? Like uh, if you go to the... Uh, uh, Santander Bank, and uh, you, you ask for one euro for one day, and they might lend you one euro, and you disappear for one day, and after that you come back and return one euro. Well, no, I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, if you ask for one million euro in, for one day, and they wouldn't obviously lend you one million. But if you promise to return it in cash in one second, right? so you receive one million euro and return it immediately, that can still work, no? Maybe not, they might call you a police or maybe ambulance. <laughs> uh, but that's, the, that's basically the logic. And if you promise to return vacuum uh, energy in short time period, then you can borrow fluctuation out of the vacuum. So energy you can borrow times time is constant, given by the uh, Planck's constant. But uh, uh, in our case, so time you borrow, right? So one, one, one over time is h, because it has a dimension of one over h, uh, one over time. So that's it. Essentially, the amplitude of fluctuation you can get from the vacuum is proportional to h. Very, very naive argument, but we give you the right answer. <laughs> there you go. OK. Uh, now, the key result. Inflation is not an instantaneous process. Inflation actually uh, lasts for some period. So this h, although we are approximated as a constant, it's not a constant. It's a slowly varying function. Now, when you produce fluctuations earlier in inflation, their wavelength gets stretched more. And you generate fluctuations later, their fluctuation gets stretched also but by less amount. Which means you look in the sky and you look at long wavelength gravitational waves. You then know that they were produced earlier in inflation. Because the amplitude of fluctuation is proportional to h, if h is a decreasing function of time, which is the case because the inflation has to end in the end, long wavelength gravitational waves should have greater amplitude than shorter wavelengths gravitational waves. So that's the prediction of inflation if you talk about vacuum fluctuation. Yeah? All right? Now, so let's look at the uh, uh, variance. So
So variance is uh, hij square times this funny factor k cubed to pi square. This is, depends on the convention of h, but uh, so you now have to uh, believe me that uh, this corresponds to the variance. So you take gravitational waves, take variance, that's what this is, and this is now doesn't have any factor of k. You have this factor 1 over k to the 3 half here for this quantity, but to get the variance, you need to square this and multiply that by k cubed. Then that will eliminate k cubed, and you get this k independent result. If h was independent of k also, well, time also, you get exactly equal amplitude at all wavelengths. This is so called scale invariant result. Okay? Uh, so that's, that's interesting, right? So this means that inflation produces gravitational waves at all wavelengths. Today, can be one centimeter, one meter, one kilometer, doesn't matter. All in amplitude, initially, or even one billion light years, or 10 billion light years, doesn't matter. They are created with equal amplitude before. That's the prediction. Okay. All right, but what we see is not necessarily primordial because shorter wavelengths enters into the horizon earlier and decays, and longer wavelength fluctuations enter the horizon later and they don't decay as much. Right. So in terms of the energy density of gravitational waves you see today, it looks like this. So this is the fluctuation that enters the horizon during the matter-dominated era. This is the gravitational waves that enter the horizon during the radiation dominant era. And what you see here is an interesting feature. So it's 1 over frequency square and constant. Now, you get the, uh, uh, so what, what do we see here? Once gravitational waves enter the horizon, then uh, they decay. <coughs> so at each wavelength, you're really looking at uh, gravitational waves entering the horizon at different times. And they experience different amounts of redshifts, so they produce some different effects. And uh, this energy density gets already multiplied by uh, k, k squared, so, uh, so this appears actually constant. If the modes enter the horizon during the radiation era, it's almost constant for scale invariant gravitational waves. And for the modes that enter the matter era, they're somewhat different. But you see this weird wiggles and stuff, right? So what are these? Uh, so in the, in the uh, radiation era, some interesting events occur. For example, you have quark gluon, huh? the uh, quark hadron phase transition. Quarks are very light, so they behave relativistic part as relativistic particles in the universe as hot, hotter than the mass of the quarks. But uh, once these quarks get confined into hadrons, they suddenly become very heavy, like uh, protons. So that happens here. When that happens, suddenly you have a disappearance of relativistic particles. You suddenly have less energy density in radiation. This modifies, in an abrupt manner, the expansion history of, inf of radiation error. That's imprinted here. And once neutrinos stop interacting with uh, elements, uh, like uh, in, uh, electrons and positrons and, and stuff, they start to freely stream. And they create viscosity for gravitational waves, and gravitational waves adapt. So you get less amplitude after that. This is the neutrino free streaming time, and after that, you get damp, damping. You get damping, but if you increase again, what is this? That's when positron and electrons combine to, and then positrons and electrons disappear. And you have only tiny fraction of positrons and electrons as electrons later. So you suddenly again have reduction in energy density in radiation. That's here. So these gravitation waves remember all these interesting events that happened in the early universe which will be very difficult to measure 
if you couldn't use gravitational waves. So these gravitational waves, energy density spectrum gives you a time machine. You can reconstruct like uh, energy density history of the radiation era from today all the way to interesting period. So what is this? This is a, a clock uh, hadron phase transition. This is electron position. What is this? So this is one TeV. This corresponds to one TeV. This is when if you had supersymmetry. We probably don't, but let's say we had. Right? Uh, even if we had it, it would be much higher energies than 1 TeV, but let's say this was 2006, so we still had hope that uh, maybe 1 TeV. Uh, so the supersymmetry particles are light before supersymmetry breaking happens. At 1 TeV, let's say these supersymmetric particles, 14 hours or whatever, uh, they became heavy. So they disappear from radiation. And suddenly, expansion history changes, and that's why it happened. So, you really have the time machine. How do you measure that? Well, so you have this uh, cosmic micro background that's sensitive to gravitational waves with uh, uh, billions of light years of wavelengths. So, this 18 to the minus 18 hertz. Just billions of light years in terms of the wavelengths. Here, the pulsar timing array is sensitive to nano hertz, and interferometers like LIGO and LISA are sensitive to milli hertz to kilo hertz. So we have these various methods to measure gravitational waves. And who knows, yeah, in the future, we may be able to see this thing. Or, or can we? Right? So how do we measure gravitational waves? Uh, so let's go back to this. You have gravitational waves coming toward you, and you have ring of particles going uh, like that. So let's uh, have laser interferometer. So you have a mirror here, which can split the laser, a beam splitter. You split the laser into two directions, and these lasers come back after being reflected by uh, mirrors. And you tune the initial phase of these lasers such that when they come back and recombine, crests and troughs of uh, laser light will cancel, <laughs> so you get no signal. So that's your initial condition, initial configuration. Gravitational waves pass by and stretch the space. So then distance between mirrors will be different, like that. Then crests and troughs no longer cancel, so you have this signal. So that's how LIGO detected gravitational waves from binary black holes. But uh, because you're constrained to the size of the Earth, wavelengths of gravitational waves you can detect in this way is limited by that. So essentially the wavelength has to be few thousand kilometers in order for light to see it. If you go to LISA, their baseline is a million kilometers, so you are sen you're sensitive to longer wavelength fluctuations. But I hope it's clear to you now that if you wanted to ever detect gravitational waves with mi billions of light years of wavelength, you, you just cannot do this way. You have to seek some alternative. Uh, so, you use the universe as a detector. So imagine that you have the homogeneous and isotropic radiation field in the universe. Like cosmic microwave background. We have that, right? We have a uh, uniform homogeneous radiation background, CMB. They let gravitational waves propagate. Then as they stretch space, light wavelengths gets stretched also. And because it's a black body spectrum, uh, if you stretch space, you stretch the wavelengths, that means that the photons get slightly colder. So if you put an uh, electron here, this electron will see colder photons coming from this way, and hot electrons coming from that way, simply because of the change in wavelengths due to the expansion of space. And um, now let's imagine that photons come from hot regions and get uh, scattered by this electron and light is coming toward you. And how do you see the light? Then you see polarization. Why? So let's look at the car. So we, when you have the sunlight cut, that's coming from the above and gets reflected by the windshield, it's horizontally polarized. 
We know that because if you buy a polarized sunglass, well, you can go to the ocean. It's more appropriate here, actually, I realize. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you get the sunlight coming from the above and gets reflected by the surface of the ocean. The polarization is horizontal. If you have the polarized sunglass that transmits only the vertical polarization, but not the horizontal, then you can see through the car. So if you uh, bring these sunglasses to the ocean, then you can see through the ocean. Yeah? But the uh, necessary and sufficient condition to produce polarization, like this one, is the scattering, or well, reflection in this case, and anisotropic incoming light. You need to have a situation where light is coming from only one side. But in the universe, there's no preferred direction. There's no direction, which is important, right? But indeed, locally you can have it. Globally you cannot have preferred direction, but locally you can have it. Locally, around this one electron, you see hot photons coming from above, hot photons coming from the below, but cold photons side. So they can produce locally an isotropic radiation field. They polarization. Yeah? That's how you produce polarization. Then you can define so E and B mode polarization depending upon what the direction of polarization is relative to the uh, direction of the change of polarization. So in this way, polarization changes, so start decreasing, go to zero, flip sign, increases, decreases, zero, flip sign. So this is a plane wave uh, change in the amplitude of polarization. In this case, Direction of the change, or wave number, is perpendicular to the direction of the polarization, or perpendicular or parallel to the direction of the polarization. That's called E mode. This is called B mode. Okay, so 45 degree tilted. And uh, they are very much uh, distinguishable because they have different parity. So E mode, if you look into the mirror, they don't change. But the B mode, if you look into the mirror, they split the sign. So it's a very, very uh, easy to distinguish between them. You can measure, in other words, this E and B modes once you have polarization maps of the cosmic micro background. All right, so how does gravitational wave <coughs> produce that? So as gravitational waves propagate, okay, you generate from the electron in the middle, electron C is hot, hot, and cold, cold. So gravitational waves are now going this way, okay? So when the gravitational wave is stretching space in this way, I my electron, I see uh, cold, cold, and hot, and hot. So you get polarization in this way. Okay. So plane wave, gravitational waves propagating in front of you, this way. Then this will be the polarization pattern that's associated with it. That's E naught. But remember, gravitational waves have two polarization. If you have cross modes, you that. That's B mode. Oh, okay. <laughs> so then you have the, the almost equal amplitude of E mode, E and B modes, but not quite the same. It turns out the B mode polarization is a little bit smaller than E mode polarization on small angular scales. The reason is that when you have now, I'm an observer sitting at the center of this sphere. And uh, gravitational waves are propagating from bottom to up. And I'm seeing the pattern of polarization generated by plane wave gravitational waves on the sky. And because these gravitational waves are printed on the uh, last of scattering surface, right when the photons last of scattering, you, remember you need scattering to produce polarization. So this uh, scattering occurred uh, many, many years ago, right, right through 2000. So that's the sphere, you project gravitational wave on there, and because gravitational waves change the uh, space only in the perpendicular direction, only on the xy plane, you change the uh, temperature. For example, if you look at this one, so uh, white means hot, so electron sitting in the middle, electron C is hot from here, hot from there, cold from there, cold from there. So electron will see something like this around it. That it doesn't see any temperature fluctuation but in this z direction, only x y direction. Then they produce polarization that looks like this. If you repeat this, 
then you have this pattern of polarization. That's E mode. Yeah. And uh, an interesting thing about this is that uh, because in the Zenith, you really have the full pattern of hot and cold, but on the horizon, you only see uh, hot and hot, and you don't really see very much cold. So in the Zenith, you have full cross, but on the horizontal axis, you have only one, this kind of thing. So polarization amplitude gets suppressed by factor two. Polarization on the horizon is factor uh, half of the polarization in Zenith. B mode, on the other hand, on the horizon, you actually don't see any polarization because you don't see any hot and cold projected along your line of sight. It's going in wrong direction. It's 45 degree tilted. So you don't have any polarization on the horizontal horizon, and you see full polarization on the Zenith. Because of this, B mode polarization is actually a bit less than E mode polarization if you project this onto the blue sky. All right, so that's a little bit of too much detail, but uh, that's how I hope that you now at least know that once you have gravitational waves propagating, they produce temperature fluctuations from which you produce polarization by scattering. All right, now inflation. So they predict uh, existence of a scalar perturbation and tensor perturbation. So tensor perturbation is the gravitational waves, scalar perturbation is the density perturbation. And uh, uh, we talked about tensor perturbation, but the scalar perturbation is nothing but uh, determinant. So this modified determinant of the space-time metric, determinant is basically density. Okay? And then we define the quantity tensor to scalar rate field, which is what? Do I have a definition somewhere? Oh, maybe not. Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, then I define the quantity, which is uh, Hij squared divided by zeta squared. This is so-called tensor to scalar rate here. And uh, we quantify amplitude of gravitational waves relative to the density perturbation squared. Then you can plot the diagram like this. This is the tensor to scalar rate here, R. We haven't found gravitational waves from inflation yet. That's why the contour doesn't close. So it's zero is still consistent. X-axis is this uh, how uh, H changes over time. So on small scales, Fluctuation is smaller, on larger scales, fluctuations are bigger. We haven't detected gravitational waves, but same applies to density perturbation generated from inflation. This has been measured already to high precision, first by Dagnap and then by Planck. So this is 2013, and you get uh, uh, this effect, the tilt, and then tends to scale everything. So this x axis is not important today. Let's focus on y-axis. <coughs> I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, but these bunch of uh, these are a bunch of models of inflation. And uh, uh, for example, when I was a master student, I was learning in the class that this lambda five to the fourth model, which looks like a Higgs potential, is the most natural, well motivated inflation model, which we ruled out in two thousand seven. And once we ruled it out, I started to hear from theorists that uh, this was never the natural model. This was the most unnatural model. <laughs> uh, then we started talking about M square phi square, which was ruled out later. Then I don't believe anyone. <laughs> but uh, this uh, a very first inflation model from which Alexei Stravinsky in 1979 calculated the amplitude of gravitation waves. This is still fits the data very well, so that will be the next target. It looks like that, that, that where that uh, field is going, it seems like. So, I don't have much time left, but then for them, just quickly go through the experiments. So, uh, there are lots of ground-based experiments going on. So, you have one telescope in Chile, another in Chile, another in Chile. And you have two in South Pole. Each experiment is about $10 million. That's the scale of the funding you get from uh, National Funding Agency, National Science Foundation in USA. All of these experiments are led by USA. But at a certain point, that's not enough. Uh, we haven't found gravitational waves yet, because maybe you have to go beyond. So you let the experiments join the force, and you create $100 million project. If that's not enough, you create $500 million experiments. Okay? Uh, maybe that's one way. 
Uh, but uh, just having more money and more detectors may not be sufficient because, because of the foreground. So you have this uh, wonderful polarization generated by gravitational waves, but that's not the only source of polarization in microwave. Our own galaxy emits light, and they also get polarization. So you have to make sure that you can distinguish between cosmic micro background and, for example, dust and synchrotron radiation. You need a wide frequency coverage, and for that, you maybe need a different kind of telescope. Uh, for example, this is the in, uh, polarized intensity in terms of the so-called antenna temperature. This is the frequency. So in this unit, CMB is roughly constant, independent of frequency and, and decays as you go to higher frequencies. Dust grows, grows as uh, uh, new to the 1.6 power. In synchrotron, goes like one over new cubed. So you need to have a wide frequency coverage to distinguish between dust, synchrotron, and CMB. All the CMB experiments stop at 250 UHz. Or if you're lucky, maybe 270. But that's not enough. You actually have to have these higher frequencies. But all the existing CMB experiments don't measure them. Because they are on the site where the atmosphere may be too thick to, to allow them to transmit. But if you go to essentially the Mars on Earth, you know, this is the closest that you can get to the Mars on, on, on Earth. That's a Therochazan Tall in Chile, 5,600 meter. For comparison, ADMA and uh, other same experiments are 5,200 meter site. This 400 meter actually makes a difference in terms of the water vapor, uh, water vapor thickness. So if you have that, then you can actually get uh, good transparency at 400 gear. So this uh, CCAT, -P CCAT P telescope is a 6 meter telescope. And uh, it's a corner university German consortium and Canadian consortium. It will try to do this very detailed measurement of the dust polarization to help other CMB experiments clean their dust. To achieve a good measurement of the 10,000 square ratio. And why Germany? Because they create good telescopes. When it comes down to steel, you just go to Germany and ask them to create a steel. Or well, do something with steel to create a wonderful telescope. All right, so telescope uh, is given. Telescope is funded, they are building it now. So that's wonderful. And uh, in fact, the Americans, this uh, $100 million mission, liked it so much, liked this telescope so much that they started to copy it. And then, but once it's copied, it, the direction it's seeing is now reverse. And there's no logo of a uh, German <laughs> company anymore. <laughs> I think they should keep it. So the idea is that uh, this vertex antenna technique, the German company will produce telescope for both correlations. And who knows, maybe we'll put it in the South Pole, too. And that will be the CMB stage 4. So uh, that could be the, another option. And to have even more frequency coverage, uh, you go to space. So that's the uh, light world mission. Uh, it's JAXA led, and there's a participation from USA, Canada, and Europe. And uh, uh, this is a satellite mission dedicated to polarization. Essentially, the next generation CMB satellite after Planck. We have a few thousand uh, barometers in space, and we have been saying that uh, we propose this mission to JAXA, and the target launched it in 2027. But I'm very happy to tell you that now it's been selected. So on May 21st, JAXA has chosen Lightbird as the next mission, so we go to L2, okay, Lagrange 2 point. And uh, uh, so we have, uh, so target tensor to scalar ratio will be 100 times better than what we have now, okay? And uh, we have 15 bands, so lots of bands, uh, 40 gigahertz to 400 gigahertz to make sure that we can clean dust and synchrotron. And you have two telescopes, uh, low-frequency telescope and high-frequency telescopes. And this high-frequency telescope is a European contribution. Okay, so currently we have uh, uh, Italian, French, uh, German, Spanish, UK, Norway, uh, Sweden, and etc. Uh, contributions on the European Consortium. And you are working very hard to make this happen. Yeah. If you want to know more, know more about this, ask uh, Patricio and Enrique. Yeah.
and they will be happy to tell you uh, everything about this. And uh, if you're lucky, you can measure a very good measurement of the uh, beam order polarization of uh, uh, gravitational waves. And in terms of this diagram, this is the current bound. If the Stravinsky is right, then you have a very good measurement of the incentive scale ratio, and you'll be very happy. If nature is cruel and the tensor to scale ratio turns out to be much smaller than 10 minus 3, this will be the bound, which is 100 times better than the current bound. So it's, it's, worth, it's worth doing this. So, final remark um, we talked a lot about vacuum fluctuation. We didn't talk about right hand side. But is it justifiable to ignore this completely in the inflation? We don't know, <laughs> but maybe not. And if you wanted to know about the impact of this on gravitational waves, read them. <laughs> <laughs> and let me just give you one spoiler, namely, if you had a vacuum fluctuation, energy density spectrum of gravitational wave would be this. But if you had matter source, you get that. And suddenly it becomes quite interesting for direct detection experiments. With inflation, you cannot do this way, but this means that the H, this expansion rate, increases over time, which is not possible. But uh, this has nothing to do with vacuum fluctuations of, of space-time, the kind we talked about. This is produced by matter fluctuations. So you don't have to obey this constraint that uh, this amplitude has to decay over frequency. So this is one consequence, and uh, there's lots to be done here. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. So we have time for a few questions uh, before we start with students. Yes, person, please. Hi. When you talk about inflation, you are talking about a time after the big bang of 10 elevated to minus 42 seconds, you know? Something like that, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you say before inflation. Some, some gravitational waves were before inflation. No, 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 no. During. During. Yeah. Ah. So gravitational waves are produced quantum mechanically. Then you need inflation to stretch wavelengths to large scales. Quantum fluctuations are there all the time. But you need inflation just to stretch the wavelength mm -hmm. to yes. macroscopic scales. And you are speaking 10 to the minus 42 seconds. Well, 36 or something. Something okay. like that. Okay. 36, 34, 32, yeah. <laughs> oh, that, oh, that. <laughs> so, in, in all the expressions and formulas that you, you saw, this, um, H plus and H cross, uh, in principle, they, they have the same amplitude. That's right. Is, is there any way where you can produce an asymmetry there? Yes. More of one? This one. If you do that, then you have a completely circularly polarized gravitational waves. And here, in fact, these, for these gravitational waves I plotted here are completely circularly polarized. You have either right handed or left handed. How do you see them? <laughs> right? Because we don't seem to hear that all the time. But uh, here you have this laser interferometer. Instantaneously, you measure only one polarization. So you cannot distinguish between left and right. But if you have the source and the gravitational wave detector that's oriented a different way, then uh, you can reconstruct the polarization. For example, you had a, a um, let's say, binary black hole merger, <coughs> and you observe it um, from different locations with different orientation, or you have some repeated source, like a, a neutron star binary merger. Well, that's also pretty short, yeah? But anyway, let's imagine that you have some um, long-lasting gravitational wave source. Then, uh, even if you had one detector, because over time, due to the Earth's rotation, orientation of this detector with respect to source changes, then you can reconstruct the polarization this way. Uh, but uh, so, so therefore you can distinguish between left and right but uh, we're talking about stochastic background you don't know where the source is coming from mm -hmm. so you cannot use this method to reconstruct polarization therefore you need actually in the same site 
the gravitational wave detectors, which are oriented differently. We don't have that yet. Uh, but for example, LISA, right? LISA has only one configuration, triangle. So you cannot measure all the polarization in one moment. But if you have two LISAs <laughs> on top of each other, <laughs> oriented different way, then you can reconstruct all polarization. If you have that, <laughs> this will be the noise curve of this super LISA. This is the circular polarization sensitivity of LISA. Then you can see this signal. A nice thing about this is that astrophysical stochastic background is not expected to be circularly polarized. Each source is circularly polarized. But if you have a collection of them, you don't expect circularly polarized. But this thing is completely circularly polarized. Right? So that's a wonderful thing because uh, this vacuum doesn't care left or right. Therefore, the vacuum fluctuations produced left and right with equal amplitude. But the matter sources may vary parity. We know that the force of weak forces by parity. But that's assuming yeah. you have an isotropy when you generate these vacuum equations. Is there any way where you cannot, you don't have this anisotropy and you have some preference for? Yeah, if you have a global violation, then sure. But this that's heavily constrained. But if you have a matter source, for example, SU2 gauge fields. In fact, this curve is based upon calculation of SU2 gauge field coupled axiom. They violate parity in the same way that uh, weak interactions vary parity. Then you get completely circular polarized gravitational waves. So that's very exciting. So uh, this matter source, for the videos you should see these papers, but this matter source can do very interesting thing. Vacuum fluctuation, left hand side, can give you scaling variant, Gaussian, parity even gravitational waves. You have a matter source. You have completely scale dependent gravitational waves, completely non Gaussian gravitational waves, and completely circularly polarized gravitational waves. So you can then really learn, if you detected that, you can learn a tremendous amount of particle physics during inflation. And frankly, to me, that's even more exciting than seeing the vacuum fluctuation. Because vacuum fluctuation, it's nice to see, but you can't really learn so much about inflation. But if you know, particle contents, that gives you much more information. Yeah. So I think uh, distinguishing between the two would be, I think, very important, once we see the gravitational waves. Yes. Uh, when you talk about the, the, um, the matter that the edge yeah. this, this way, uh, this means extra degree of freedom, yes. uh, different from the internal? That's right? right, yeah. I mean, this more fields, or scalar fields, or whatever, there are that in addition to the yeah, yeah, so there is a bit of subtlety here. So indeed, these are extra degrees of freedom, so spectator fields. Mm. Yeah, those uh, particles that do not uh, dominate energy density, but uh, they do other things. If you had a scalar field, however, there's a theory saying that if you have uh, isotropic and uh, homogeneous space time, you cannot generate gravitational waves from scalar at the linear order. You need to have a non linear fluctuation from scalar field, like a second order. But if you have a second order, they also produce scalar perturbation, not just gravitational waves. That scalar perturbation is completely scale, in, completely, uh, scale dependent, completely non Gaussian, which would be already incompatible with the uh, constraints we have on scalar perturbation. Same is true for vector matter, like U1 gauge fields. They cannot generate tensor perturbations at the linear level. But if you have SU2, SU2 gauge fields contain spin 2 particles in it. So they linearly mix with gravitons, and they can produce gravitational waves at a linear level. That's new, and uh, that's very exciting. So that's how people sort of got excited and tried to do this kind of calculation. So this is based upon uh, SU2 coupled axiom. And do these extra fields let's say, the the standard model of a single field mutation? Because, yeah. yeah, there's no light bound here. Yeah. For example, you can generate uh, R of theta minus 2 for sub Planckian excursion of scale of wind yeah. So you can use these, for example, to produce detectable gravitational waves even from string theory. 
because people usually think string theory can, cannot produce detectable gravitational waves, but that statement is based only on the vacuum, the left-hand side. Once you add, what well, you don't have, you have to add. String theory contains lots of accents, lots of uh, uh, SUN, KG fields. Then they naturally produce uh, detectable gravitational waves. Then, uh, can you explain from that picture, I mean, the, 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 the new result, um, what is in the left? Do you, do you some remaining of the vacuum footprint? I mean, just to... Yes. No, no, the, all of these are actually produced by the matter. Oh, yeah, so so this, this, this is the modes that enter the horizon during the matter era. And these are the modes that enter the horizon during the radiation era. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this means that, uh, well, um, and the, the best uh, chances to, to detect it would be, uh, as you mentioned, I think, uh, more uh, Lisa or other uh, No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. I, I just, in this thought, I wanted to make the point that uh, up around, even if light bar didn't see gravitational waves, Lisa may be able to see. But of course, better is that once we see here, yeah. then we can have the target for, yeah. for them. Yeah. So that would be very nice. So we see it in light bar and discover that, wow, it's actually non-scaling variant and non-Gaussian and completely strikingly polarized. Right? This produces EV and TV polarization coupling, for example. If we see them, then we can say, hey, and let the laser into phenomena people, you should see them, too. Labor is not uh, uh, able to see circular polarization, only linear. We can, we can. No, no, no. Oh, okay. No, it's a circularly polarized gravitational waves, which give you EV and TV correlations. Oh, yeah, yeah, that we can see. Uh, and, and what about the fact that LIBOR is using milling uh, these quantities precisely to calibrate the process angle? Is this a stopper? Or? No, very, uh, very, very nice uh, uh, question. Let me just uh, give you... Uh, uh, So these are EV polarization generated by tensor perturbations, whose TV correlation shape is completely different from the TB, TE from scalars. So when you have angle miscalibration, what you do is you take TE from scalar and multiply that by angle. That's this. But shape is completely different because this is generated by TV of the tensor. So you can do then calculation and show that you can totally distinguish between this and that. So even, even if you try to simultaneously calibrate your angle and uh, measure TV, you can do it with very, loss, very little loss in single numbers. So this is not a showstopper at all. Is that because the shape? Hmm? It's because the different shape of the... Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Any more questions? Okay, if not, let's thank you again.